Hi, and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. Today, our guest is Dylan Chen. Dylan is the founder of Commonwealth Labs. They're building decentralized governance tools for blockchain networks. And they're also the creators of Edgeware. It's a smart contract platform, a blockchain protocol built on Parity Substrate. And it leverages Wasm as a smart contract language, and it has built-in on-chain governance. Now, I'm sure many of you will remember that Edgeware launched in September, and it did cause some controversy. To sum it up, Edgeware introduced a novel token distribution mechanism called a lock drop. And in a lock drop, essentially, it allows people to lock ETH in a smart contract for a set period of time in exchange for tokens. And the tokens you receive are proportional to the amount of Ether you lock up. So let's say there's a ratio of one to a thousand. So you lock up one ETH and you get a thousand tokens in exchange for that commitment. And the way that Edgeware did this lock drop is they also introduced a weighting ratio proportional to the duration of time that you would lock up your ETH. So if you lock it up for three months, the weight is one. If you lock it up for six months, it's 1.3. And if you lock it up for 12 months, it's 2.2. So you're, you're incentivized to lock up your ETH for as long as possible. So if you're just sitting on Ether and you don't know what to do with it, the idea is that, well, you might as well lock it up here because you're, at the end of that period, you're going to get the Ether back and you're also going to get these tokens. People could also signal their intent to participate in Edgeware by simply providing an address holding ETH. So signaling is kind of a way of saying, I want to participate in the Edgeware network without moving or locking Ether. Signalers would also receive Edgeware tokens, but in a much lower proportion to those who locked ETH. In the case of Edgeware, it's something around 20%. Now, the lock drop is a really innovative and novel way to distribute tokens. And I thought it was kind of cool, but there were some people who took issue with it, and particularly because smart contracts holding ETH could also signal on behalf of all the funds held within that contract. So let's take, for example, the wrapped Ether smart contract. Currently, there's something around 2.7 million ETH locked up in that contract. Well, whoever deployed that contract could signal for 2.7 million ETH in the Edgeware smart contract and receive Edgeware for you know, all those people that are locking up their Ether in the wrapped Ether contract. Now, this raised some questions and a bit of a conspiracy, particularly because of Commonwealth's proximity to Parity Team. You know, there were some theories that they were pressured to do this so that Parity could signal the locked ETH in the, in the Parity multisig, which as a result of a bug can probably never be spent. In addition to that, there were some technical issues when the network went live, which prompted the team to downgrade the network to a testnet and postpone the actual launch until much later. What's also interesting is that in response to Edgeware, there's a group of people who decided to fork the code and launch a sister network called Straight Edge. Now, this other network is essentially the same. In fact, it even uses the same Genesis file for token distribution, except for one important distinction. Smart contracts do not have the ability to signal on behalf of the Ether held within them. One of the people behind Straight Edge was Sunny, and so it was natural that we did this interview together. So this all happened in September. Why on earth are we doing this now? Well, we wanted to give Edgeware and Dylan the benefit of hindsight, and I think it was well worth the wait. The lock drop was a really interesting token distribution mechanism. We really wanted to do an episode about this, but had we done this in the middle of the launch, in the middle of all this chaos, I think we would have been clouded and we wouldn't have been able to get to some of the important lessons learned here. Dylan was extremely open and very forthcoming and shared all of you know, his thinking and the lessons that he learned through this process. And I think it made for a much better conversation as a result, one that I'm sure you'll appreciate. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor for today's episode, Pepo. You know, I've said this before, Pepo is like a mix between Twitter, TikTok, and Steemit. Twitter because the content is mostly focused around crypto and entrepreneurship. TikTok because on Pepo, you share short 30-second video clips. And Steemit because of the incentive mechanisms and the way that it leverages crypto. So when you want to show your love for content on Pepo, you tip people by smashing that Pepo button and sharing Pepo coins. And when you like something and you want to reply and take part in a conversation, you show your interest by putting up Pepo coins as well. 
I've been using Pepo for a little while now, and I really like it. I like the community of people that is starting to grow there. And I've been sharing some exclusive content over on Pepo with my followers. So for instance, we recently did an interview with Yaya Fanusi, who is a former CIA analyst and an expert in AML, KYC, and counterterrorism. It was a great interview. And before we recorded the podcast, I went to my Pepo followers and I said, hey, we're going to be interviewing this guy in a little bit. What kind of things should we be asking him? What are, what's on your mind? How can we make this interview better? And so in the future, I'll be doing this more and more. Whenever we schedule an interview, I'll first go to my Pepo followers and say, hey, like, what kind of things should we be asking this person? And what are you interested in that you know, would help us make this interview better? So to download Pepo, go to pepo.com slash epicenter. That lets them know we sent you. And there you can download the app for iOS and Android. And you can find me there. My username is Seb 2.0. That's Seb 2 P-O-I-N-T zero. Yeah, come talk to me on Pepo. Uh, be happy to see you there. We'd like to thank Pepo for their support of Epicenter. And with that, here is our interview with Dylan Chen. We're here with Dylan Chen, who's the co-founder of Commonwealth Labs. Dylan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, it certainly has. I think we started this conversation about six months ago or something like that. Um, you know, well before six months, I think so. Um, yeah, right around when the uh, lock drop first started to, to actually kick off. Um, and so it's been a wild ride since. Yeah, and a lot has happened since then. It has been a wild ride indeed. Um, so before we get into the heart of the matter, which is edgeware and uh, everything related to it, let's get a bit of background. How did you first get involved in crypto? Yeah, it's an interesting for for me. I was a uh, um, born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and so like, didn't really have too much exposure to like general tech stuff. Um, wasn't born in, you know, Silicon Valley or anything. Um, but I actually read, I think, uh, the Wired article on Silk Road and was kind of just really interested in how Bitcoin or like this, this type of technology, like, um, was something that anyone could tap into, um, obviously for different use cases and then got an internship in the Valley um, ended up getting, being paid in Bitcoin or I requested to be paid in Bitcoin. I wasn't like a big gamer in high school. And so like really couldn't mine. And that was kind of the uh, rabbit hole moment for me. Um, so through college, did some network research, um, looking at different addresses and, and things like that through through a lab at Penn. Started another company with a uh, co-founder here, uh, Drew. Uh, we built a company called Source that was Airbnb for Wi-Fi. So sharing bandwidth, we wanted to use an ERC-20 token. And then also um, helped invest at uh, Rough Draft into like you know crypto companies, and this was like during 2017, essentially. So kind of been all around, um, but yeah, that's that's the kind of story for me. And what is it about crypto that you found attractive and wanted that made you want to dedicate more time and build a company and a product? I was attracted basically to the coordination and allowing like different actors who might not know each other uh, to like act in like a trust minimized settings. Um, and so I think the use cases that were really interesting to me were less on the financial side, but like, you know, creating some type of research coin to like help basically produce more public goods. So that kind of angle for me. Um, and I think that's kind of naturally led into the work we do at Commonwealth. So creating a new system like Edgeware or creating an interface or tools that help like other people coordinate around things. One thing that we'd really like to do is yeah, just continue that stuff forward. Yeah, cool. And so, uh, you know, you then you withdrew. You uh, help, you guys co-founded the Commonwealth Company together. And so, what was sort of the vision of the Commonwealth Company then? Commonwealth. The uh, the tagline we're using now is basically uh, we use Commonwealth to organize your community. You know, that kind of encompasses governance. So, what is like community organizing? It's distributing a token or just like um, aligning all your stakeholders, actually getting people to discuss issues. Or topics, um, and then funding different things. So covering that whole gamut and building out um, a product and protocol suite that actually helps with any protocol to help help them make their community work better. Um, hopefully, we can extend outside of uh, crypto, or as crypto eats the world, everything kind of will be uh, organized through Commonwealth. And so, what does the team look like uh, today? Like, so I know you and Drew are still working together, but uh, since then, um, the team has expanded. So. How many people are there working on these projects and sort of what are the different projects that are being built right now? Yeah, so I guess the, the two questions. So what's the team look like now? And then I can get to the second part of what projects that we're working on. For the first answer, we have another co-founder, Raymond Zong. 
he was uh, uh, formerly at uh, at Princeton, um, also at AngelList and, and a few other places and got his uh, crypto exposure, I guess, through those venues. We've been longtime friends. And so we kind of came together uh, with multiple perspectives. Drew's had a, a academic research background. Um, and so he actually recently left his uh, PhD at uh, Hebrew U to be at um, uh, Commonwealth full time. Um, so that's the founding team. Uh, we're a team of eight now. Um, so mostly engineering heavy with uh, a little bit of product sprinkled in. Um, so based here in New York to a certain extent, but we're also distributed so and hiring. So if you are an engineer and listening to this, please reach out to me. I don't know if that, that's a shameless plug, but um, uh, in terms of the projects that we're working on, I think the bulk of our, our work now is still focused on Edgeware. So I know we'll, we'll kind of talk about what that is, um, but uh, the one sentence for Edgeware is it's a, a Polkadot smart contract platform. Um, we think the first use cases basically will be like um, spinning up different DAOs and funding those DAOs with the Edgeware treasury. Beyond that, we have uh, a multi-chain governance interface, um, Commonwealth, Commonwealth.im. And so uh, we basically hooked into Near Protocol, Cosmos, uh, Polkadot, Kusama, Edgeware, Straight Edge, uh, soon to be. And basically, we'll continue to uh, expand outwards from there. Um, so those are the kind of the, the two main initiatives right now. It's been a it's been an interesting ride, uh, ride. But you know, as for Commonwealth, we you know we'll work with any protocol essentially out there that has like governance needs, and uh, yeah, work with them on that through that. So, what exactly is a multi-chain governance interface, and what kind of work do you do specifically with chains to help them on governance? It's a really great question. Governance is a uh, uh, a really large topic. Um, so there's the gamut from just talking um, on what the governance structure should be. So I know Sonny, you even we were talking about who the token holder should be for a type of like stable coin or a collateralized stable coin. That would be like one thing that we might talk with uh, protocols on. But the in terms of product and the things that we actually built on the day to day basis, um, it's basically uh, a discourse like forum where you can actually just talk. With threaded conversation, um, we basically, I guess it's, we call it like governance coverage. So any on-chain governance um, action that they might have. So whether it's like signaling polls, treasury and slash like fund distribution, allocating certain permissions to council members or things like that will help build an interface um, essentially that covers that whole thing. And then also allow you to talk about those specific issues um, and then put that all into to Commonwealth. So what Commonwealth kind of looks like is basically it, it kind of looks like there's um, a bunch of subreddits and they all have like uh, different activities that you can do. You can talk about things, you can discuss issues and you can fund different projects. So for, for instance, the Cosmos community has a bunch of different forums that they leverage to talk about governance proposals and things that will eventually make it into governance. How does that differ from what the individual projects and communities are also already maintaining in terms of forums and things like yeah. that. There's a lot of projects out there that still don't have um, a forum. We've seen a lot of projects use um, Telegram, Discord, um, and haven't really spun up like a, a place where kind of like uh, real work <laughs> or proposals can kind of get done. The other thing I would say is we basically want to, to make sure that everything everything is decentralized. And the future for us is making sure that we're, we're still like an interface and we can run like a centralized a pinning service. But like the conversation should still be the, the thread should be like viewable in any type of interface. So, for example, for if we're talking about like the Cosmos forum, um, ideally it's not run on discourse or it's run on this like decentralized backend. And Commonwealth is one place where you can come and see it. You can still see the same stuff um, in the existing forum. And that's the feature we're building towards. I think we're still a few months away from productizing like the, the full decentralization front. We're still working on a lot of things that are directly related to the user experience. And on the, the the leg of user experience, another thing we found um, is it's it's still tough, I guess, within a community to know what everyone is thinking, especially as these communities get larger. And so having the ability to like run signaling polls on either like a token holder basis is something that we've heard time and time again. And so that stuff is built right into the forum itself. Yeah, so continuing to make sure that like, in addition to any forum that's out there, we can kind of like continue to build on top of that. So you announced Edgeware at the Web3 Summit in 2018. And I remember seeing that talk. It was like right before lunch. And it was like kind of this short little talk before everybody went out. And a few of the takeaways that I took from that talk was one that you, you said that 
Edgeware was a test net for active governance. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what you meant by that? I, I think we've kind of maintained that to the vision throughout uh, 2018, 2019, and hopefully uh, for the, the whole lifetime of Edgeware. But so um, we, I think um, everyone in the space still feels like we haven't found the exact right governance uh, mechanism for like creating a, a protocol and making it sure it runs well. It's, it's, that's a few nested governance experiments that we're running. Um, so one, Edgeware itself has like, uh, a pretty robust governance mechanism. And I'm sure Sunny will have things to say about that, but we have a council, there's a treasury, um, and you can disperse funds from that treasury through on-chain votes, same in the same manner, um, as, as Cosmos as well. There's democracy. So anyone can submit a proposal and have it be voted on. But on, on top of that, basically it's, uh, again, a smart contract platform. And the thing that we'd hope um, as the kind of like guiding light for, for projects to, to help build on, on Edgeware would be that, okay, a DAO should be able to experiment or use some of the features that um, we've kind of already built for the chain itself to run their own type of governance experiments. And so beyond like the, the core governance experiments, like um, we'd like to see DAOs that run with a quadratic voting implementation or um, do things on a one person, one vote. Uh, type of basis using the Edgeware identity module that we've built, um, where people can link um, a Twitter address, a GitHub handle, and then use that as the basis for for running these um, DAOs. That's kind of what we mean by running these kind of active um, governance experiments in a decentralized manner. Could you uh, talk a little bit about some details of what's special in the Edgeware governance process? Like, how 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 does it compare to the one in Tezos, for example, or in Polkadot, or in Cosmos. So uh, we we inherit a lot from um, building on Substrate. So we're built on Substrate. So that's uh, Polkadot's, or I guess like the the, the parity slash uh, Polkadot ecosystem standard for building blockchains. Um, there's a bunch of modules. So for any uh, listeners that you know do blockchain development, obviously um, you can basically swap in and out these different modules. The module we've chosen are are closely related to the Polkadot governance. And so that is um, continuously being iterated on. And there's a wealth of information out there that you know I can also point um, listeners to afterwards. But for um, Edgeware specifically, we have a, a treasury. Um, and so those are token-weighted votes that kind of allocate funds from that. There's a council with elected council members. Each council member um, is elected on a rolling basis. Right now, the, the parameter that um, is set in the Genesis spec is uh, 13 council members. And then with seven kind of like in waiting, those are voted in on like a, a token holder basis. So one token, one vote. But other things that are kind of like hidden in there are the, the notion of like time lock slash uh, stakeholder voting. So the longer you lock for, even if you're a uh, smaller token holder, you can kind of amplify your voice. And so it's not just on like a, on a stake basis. Another kind of feature, again, inherited by, uh, using Polkadot governance is the ability is like a cool off period. So in, in the same way that someone can kind of like rage quit in, um, in Moloch DAO, there's a, a waiting period for a proposal to actually like have a binding change through on-chain governance. And so, you know, people can think through like, okay, we voted this in, does this really make sense? I could go on and on. Um, there's other experiments that we'd like to continue to run, but that's kind of the, the base layer um, of what uh, the network is launching with. And so what kind of functionality does Edgeware provide that like makes it more enticing as a place to do governance experimentation? So let's say I wanted to build a new DAO. What kind of features does are in Edgeware that I couldn't find on Ethereum, for example? I'm personally most interested in, and the thing that we've heard a lot of great feedback on is one, the treasury itself, and two, uh, the identity module. So just directly linking a uh, Twitter address or, or XYZ, like Web2 identity to um, an address um, allows you to experiment um, hopefully easily with uh, different identity standards and like voting schemes. But for the first part, we, we've heard um, a lot of teams basically want to run. Here's an example. So a team out West right now um, wants to build uh, donor advice funds. So those are legally linked uh, or a donor advised fund is I donate uh, to this fund itself. Um, I get the tax write off, but I can still advise like where I want those funds to be allocated. They have to be allocated to a 501c3. So one thing that we've talked about is basically having um, them pull from the Edgeware Treasury. So the Edgeware Treasury, I think, is probably the key feature um, here. 
allowing different people to like have their DAO be seated pretty easily. And uh, uh, we've seen a lot of traction related to that. Can you talk a little bit about how the identity linking works? I haven't thought about these things. You know, we've been so geared up for launch uh, recently. But um, yeah, specifically with respect to identity. So you can have just an arbitrary string that gets stored as an attestation. And then it's a it's a few step process. So I can submit, hey, so like this is a Twitter type of attestation. And then this is my handle. And then I'll say, and then I have to post a proof um, on the analog. I have to sign a message. And then I post the hash of that message. And then a verifier, right now it's just like a single address, comes in and looks at both those things and checks if it actually is valid. Hopefully that uh, the role of verifier should be decentralized as time goes on. So it could be, it could go to, you know, an M of N type of voting scheme, or, you know, it could have like a, some token holder basis for creating or verifying some of these claims. But uh, hopefully it's pretty modular and any type of claim can, can kind of fit in this uh, scheme. Is this something that's built into to Substrate or is this something you guys built? This is something that we've built, but I, I definitely should highlight that uh, there is really interesting work going on in the, uh, I guess, like the Substrate repo specifically. So the team at uh, Parity is also working on uh, similar identity stuff. And I mean, in general, like the, the ecosystem, I think, has done a really great job and has um, spent a lot of time focusing on identity. So Kilt is another great team that's that's also working on things. Yeah, but there's a whole active d- bunch of developer teams that are focusing on identity, and you know we are one of them. That's a really cool idea. I've, I never thought that about this particular way of doing identity verification for a blockchain. Is there any work being done on maybe automating that? I feel like you could maybe use something like maybe I'm wrong here, but something like TLS Notary to verify. Let's say like a Twitter page, which would have a signed message. And so basically nodes could just verify like a URL, crawl it, look for a signed message, know that it's coming from Twitter, and then mm-hmm. use that information. Is, is that kind of like maybe thinking further ahead, things that you think would be possible? It's similar to what I, Chainlink does, right? Yeah. Something, oh, something I didn't know Chainlink. Yeah, yeah, so something something similar to that. Yeah, so I mean, I guess like if if we want to call like identity schemes, like a subset of oracles, I guess like it, you know, it can be similar to that. I think there's, well, there's two things that I think are really interesting. So we're actually uh, working on like a, a zero knowledge variant of this. So you can have like a, a zero knowledge attestation. Um, so I'm included in this group and I have probably more than, you know, X number of followers. And then using that to potentially create like a, you know, as like a voting team go So only allow individuals who have larger than uh, 10K followers to participate in this DAO or some governance scheme. And then the second thing I think is it's just like a super recent development. I don't know if um, you all saw today on Twitter, Jack uh, Dorsey talked about how they want to decentralize Twitter. Um, And so that was really interesting. And so having some type of notary service or directly pulling from like the API or whatever type of decentralized like backend, so to speak, that they build, I think it are like would be like future things that we can want to continue um, exploring and, and working on. But I mean, I, you know, even within the, I guess, like ETH sphere, like there's humanity DAO, all these experiments are, are like closely related. So I'm still um, attesting to like a Twitter handle or something like that. And then some set of, I guess, verifiers are kind of making sure that it's, it's valid. So I don't think we're the only ones doing it, but I think it's, uh, it's ex- interesting. I think we feel like the porting of like a Web2 identity to like the Web3 sphere is probably the easiest way to onboard people instead of going to like, the KYC route of like onboarding like driver's licenses or, you know, social security numbers and things like that. And um, I guess that would be my overall thoughts on, uh, on identity in general. So how did you get introduced to the Polkadot team and why did you just decide to build Edgeware on Substrate? Yeah. So I think it, it comes down to the right place, right time. Um, so we were lucky enough to be, well, so one, um, so we incorporated the company um, in call it like mid to late uh, 2018, um, and had been had been like thinking through uh, different governance experiments that we had wanted to run. We always knew we had wanted to build the governance interface, but felt like we needed like a community that we could actually either directly help with. And so, through talking with folks at Web3 and Parity, 
we we kind of like came up with uh, an idea that had been floating around the ecosystem. Um, and so that was this idea of Edgeware. And um, there was a few pieces that basically came together in a series of conversations. We talked about how we should, okay, if we have a blank slate to start with for some type of uh, smart contract platform, how should we distribute tokens? How should like votes be allocated? And are there any other things that we will kind of want to do with it? And so basically through 2018 and then basically up until Web3 Summit, there were kind of like these water cooler jam sessions um, that we talked about these things. And so that was kind of how the lock drop came to be, which I know we'll talk about. Um, that's how we decided on uh, this treasury framework and talked about linking identities to that. I hope I <laughs> gave a, a quick TLDR on the history of, uh, of how Edgeware came to be. Yeah, and so a lot of the uh, tech in uh, Edgeware is based off a lot, you know, importing a lot of the tooling from Substrate. Can you like give us an idea of like which pieces of the substrate of the Edgeware stack are from Substrate and which are like the novel pieces of Edgeware stack? Yeah, so we've done most of the experimentation around the edges. Um, so I, I think, I mean, to to think through Substrate, so there's the the networking layer. We don't touch that, so it you know uses lib B2B and stuff like that. Um, there's the consensus layer, different uh, implementations for waiting stake. We don't touch that either. We use modules um, for the treasury, slashing, all this stuff is, is um, included in Substrate. The things that we've built are basically um, four modules. So it's identity, there's signaling essentially. So actually running like a, a, a carbon vote like scheme weighted by uh, like a token balance with like different types of polls. So binary, yes, no, rank choice as well. And then I guess one module we've built is basically allocating um, tokens directly to the treasury and uh and things like that so the i guess like the biggest experiment that we ran was basically building the, the lock drop itself so that was like you know a th- sets of ethereum contracts and then the associated ui to help make this process run pretty smoothly so again still more around like the uh coordination and uh ui stuff sure and so with the uh web assembly uh smart contracts from my understanding you you mostly import those from substrate what's the uh current status or uh, usability of this because it's been a lot a while since i've tried playing around with it but when i tried playing around with it about four or five months ago it still seemed like heavily a work in progress where you couldn't really do sort of like cross contract calls and such so could you tell us about a bit of the status of what the developer ux would be if i wanted to build start writing smart contracts on edgeware yeah I would say, so you can definitely still experiment around with these things. Um, it definitely, ha- I don't think it's been a, a, a focus um, either at uh, Parity or at Commonwealth either. Um, so the stack right now is, well, just the TLDR. So you can write, yeah, um, as Sunny mentioned, Wasm smart contracts. Um, so there's one specific module for that. Um, on top of that, there, there's the ability to like write in a language of your choosing, anything that compiles down to Wasm. Um, and right now the uh, Parity is built uh, I guess like a library uh, parity ink. And so you can write essentially Rust smart contracts, everything without like the standard lib. And with that, work still needs to be done on the first layer, the smart contract module to, as as Sonny mentioned, create cross con- uh, contract calls, create calls from other modules into the contract module and like having them work across like one specific chain. But there are tutorials out there that do exist and like people have been experimenting. I would, I would definitely point... Uh, folks to like the the riot chats that are specifically related to like smart contract laws and smart contract development in the uh, polka dot ecosystem to like learn more essentially what are some of the interesting uh contracts or projects that have been built so far or are in process of being built yeah i mean the things that we so basically post-launch the things that we would like to build are like mulled out <laughs> on to within this framework. So pulling from the treasury to allocate funds to this place. Um, again, um, I think the the projects that are still in flight, talking to Garrett at East Node, um, based out in Japan, he's also thinking about things like this. And then um, what I alluded to before, um, running these different DAFs, donor advised funds through on Edgeware uh, would be like another example of a project within, I guess, the, the Edgeware sphere. It's really tough to keep track of um, other interesting projects that are happening in the wider polka dot sphere, but I know there's there's always experimentation going on. There's too much going on for me to keep track. So the Edgeware launch was an interesting one. So let's talk a little bit <laughs> about what happened. And I mean, 
for context, I think that a lot of people were excited about seeing Edgeware launch. I mean, I was certainly following it and seeing what would happen like post launch. But I think it's safe to say that things did not go as expected. So can you walk us through, you know, the the time leading up to the launch and what was going on sort of within the team and in the ecosystem? One, I, I just thought the segue was funny. And so I, I want to say that. So yeah, I, I think um, we had always kept this um, September 15th date and we wanted to always do something around that date, whether it was like uh, the, the mainnet launch or um, some other type of like road to mainnet launch. So like we, something like that. And so, you know, we, we wanted to make sure like uh, something came out at that time. And I guess the things that we had done, we had run several test nets um, throughout the, the, the spring um, and summer with specific known issues. And basically the thought process for us and the, it seems like the community was, or was to be able to iterate fast from that. So launch something and then change things on the fly using like the, the built-in Polkadot governance framework um, or, and or the pseudo key. And so one issue I think that Sunny even brought up was the fact that there was like slashing events going on. Specifically, people have to submit like an I'm online heartbeat during a specific session. And if a new validator had joined, they might be slashed incorrectly, essentially. Um, so we were continuing to work with uh, different folks, Parity, you know, Web3 Foundation, all these um, other teams to, to kind of like pinpoint that. So the fix specifically that we had decided to go with was turning off slashing and then turning it on once those are fixed had been fixed and we could run a governance upgrade to, to make sure that those things were turned off. I guess, um, and <laughs> we released a blog post uh, detailing basically these expectations. And I think maybe we, we over-promised a little bit on what it was. Um, we had talk, uh, we called it like a soft launch. And I think since folks had within the community had still thought that like we were doing like a, a mainnet type of launch, that there was <laughs> a lot of confusion and miscommunication happened there. That's the uh, that's the experience from I think the the Commonwealth side. Um, but I'd be very curious to hear from Sunny specifically on how uh, I, you know, as like a running a validator, like uh, the view from outside. One of the solutions that was brought up was to fix the to turn off slashing. But from my experience, what happened, what ended up actually happening was one of the parameters was set to zero percent. But it actually wasn't the uh, slashing parameter. It was a parameter that has to do with when, so- if I report a fault that someone else has done. So let's say someone double signed and I'm the one who reports it. That was traditionally set to 5%. Then I would get 5% of their slashing amount as a reward for reporting. But that was set to 0%. And that seems like something where it just sort of in the fly of the moment where like such a mad rush towards launch could have been like, you know, if, if, if it, things were taken a bit more slowly, it could have maybe worked out, you know, we could have caught these tiny things. So in retrospect, do you think that was the right approach to take of like getting it out the door and like having to stick to that September 15th heart date, especially when there were so many voices in the community who are trying to bring up a lot of these problems? Yeah, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. I think um, always like making sure that everyone's bought into something. Um, uh, is is something that you know uh, the community like will definitely take into account going forward, and hopefully we can use the the signaling tools, the informal informal channels that that we have to like discuss these things going forward. And I would definitely agree, like keeping to a deadline or, or making sure that things are working. Um, it's it's it always it's always really tough, especially in this kind of distributed setting where changes and like hot fixes are are pretty tough to apply, or at least like take like maybe a, a week or two to plan. I would basically definitely agree with you there. Um, I think, I mean, it's interesting just because there's like multiple parameters. There's um, on the node level, essentially. So, um, and then on the substrate side and the code base is continuously evolving on the substrate side. And so within the modules, like, you know, they're basically like, yeah, calls that like, or extrinsics basically that like have to be turned on and off specifically there. And I think we didn't change those there. But yeah, hopefully going forward, I, the the new testnet is up and it is running pretty smoothly. So spin up your validators and nodes and uh, jump in to a conversation to talk about like potentially launching the network. It's very much ready um, from a technical standpoint now. So whether it's December or January, I think what 
hopefully the community can come to consensus on uh, when's like an appropriate time. One of the other issues that I also brought up a few weeks prior to the launch was that the allocation that was the result of running the lock drop scripts was different than the one that was shown on the Commonwealth webpage. And it turns out that that had to do something with how the multipliers are being calculated. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I, I, so, so what Sunny is alluding to, so um, when the lock drop was one run, the, well, TLDR lock drop. So you can lock tokens for you know three, six, or 12 months. Um, and so we had this process going on for three months. And if you had locked for a shorter or short amount of time, three months or a longer amount of time, you got a corresponding bonus. In addition to that, uh, there's this notion of uh, uh, like an early participation bonus. So the the earlier you participated during this open enrollment period, a person would get uh, more tokens essentially. And so the schedule that we had put out was basically 50%, you know, and then falling pretty smoothly down to like 0% essentially at like the final date of the open lock drop period. And when the calculation on uh, applying the early participation bonus to the like the whole lock schedule, I think we basically underspecified um, what was actually happening there. So was the, the question, you know, uh, in different community channels, um, I think people had talked about, was it multiplicative or was it additive? And I don't, I don't, I think we made a few comments on those and then had the like uh, script in a separate repository for like open inspection. And there's that kind of like miscommunication from that perspective as well. I would say that, I mean, just the TLDR kind of like what those things are. And so that was something that we've, I mean, fixed now, but certainly we, we hoped uh, more community eyes on these types of uh, open source projects is always helpful just to make sure that we do get everything right, that all the parameters are checked. And I would say, again, everything's up there now. And so hopefully people can do another once over or twice over um, to make sure that um, everything is actually sound from that perspective. But one of the things was I, I did bring up this problem before the launch, but it wasn't really addressed. So what do you think is like the best way for, and you know, th th this actually happens in Cosmos as well, where, you know, they're, they're in the Cosmos Hub 2 launch, the prior upgrade that from Cosmos Hub 2 to Cosmos Hub 3 back about a month ago, that also got messed up. And it turns out there were people who were bringing up like, like concerns saying like, wait, we haven't tested this piece yet. And then when we asked to get to the upgrade, it turns out it didn't work out, which we actually did do the upgrade successfully just this morning. But how do you think is the best way for community members to communicate with development teams when they see problems and make sure that these concerns are like taken properly? I, I think it comes down to like tooling. And so, you know, even Sunny, yeah, even, even on this call, like I, it's, it's tough for me to remember specifically, like if, like, I definitely remember, uh, like concerns around slashing being brought up in like, you know, our, so we have several channels that we use like discord specifically was, and we have a validator channel there. And so a lot of discussion was going on specifically related to that issue. But as you, as like, we all know, like there's so many messages, especially like being passed around in different channels that a lot of things just get lost in the fray. And so I think flagging a message, um, whether it's like a community admin or things like that to actually surface those concerns and having like a, a better process to run that is like sorely needed. So from the tooling side, from a process side, those are two ways to like um, potentially address this. So on the tooling side, like honestly, we, we, we'd hope that Commonwealth is like a place for like surfacing these concerns and making sure that they get addressed or talked about in like a community call. Yeah, I was going to say, is, is it a little bit p peculiar that Commonwealth is building? Yeah, it's, and then and then it's the process thing as well. And so like if, you know, if a community member sees something, um, they should be able to like boost it, you know, um, and link to it on like the, the store of record um, on Commonwealth. It's really tough. I, I think for us, like the, the things that we wanted to like also do uh, and like our plant and like the product suite is is like building bots to um, allow people to like flag these things and then actually have them be talked about in the community call. So if Sonny had mentioned that, you know, he should add like a bot in Discord and then we would be able to like automatically add that to like some community call that happened or like um, have it be shown on, on Commonwealth and like have that be like a, a proposal where we should talk about that thing. But uh, it's always tough doing a bunch of things at once. And it's certainly a humbling experience. But, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, different projects. Yeah. So early on after the launch in September, a decision was made 
uh, through a blog post to essentially take this network that you had just launched and make it into a, basically a test net. Talk about the decision process that went through, went into making that decision. What was the reaction <clears throat> from the community? There's a period of time, basically post network launch, um, where in the Telegram channels, um, I would say like Discord specifically, where people were talking about like different solutions for this. So um, applying direct hot fixes to the network through like a pseudo key or or basically like rolling the network back um, essentially to a certain extent. And we should actually talk about straight edge with respect to this at, in, in two seconds. But so basically informally, um, the everyone kind of, it seems like came to consensus that we should, okay, like take a step back and just like, you know, try to like downgrade this network specifically. So we released the blog post talking about that. And then the reaction to that was, I actually feel like pretty positive. It wasn't an easy decision for anyone to make, but um, I'm actually really grateful for like the the community that's come together um, through the lock drop process through, you know, the open validating on these test networks. Um, it seems like everyone's like in it and like wants to see it succeed, like with the right foundation set. And so it there, I don't know if there was like, much backlash. I think people are still like, hope, you know, I think the things that we've heard from the community is like, okay, let's take things slow and like, make sure we get everything right. And also it's basically that, but it, it hasn't been too bad, but yeah, I mean, on the, on, it's interesting because, uh, straight edge was like a, a network that was launched and Sunny should definitely, uh, I'll let Sunny talk about that, but it was interesting to see like, uh, a new or like, uh, side by side approaches taken essentially. So when straight edge launched, we launched with the same balance concerns, um, slashing as well. And like a, a decision was made to, to launch a new network pretty soonly after that. And so, um, it's just interesting to see how different communities, um, even with the same set of token holders can like change an outcome, but yeah, maybe somebody, Sonny wants to comment a little more on that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, on the straight edge network, we we which we'll get into in a, few, in, a in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, we essentially noticed the balances issue, and we did do a hard fork within like about two or three hours to fix that. Uh, we still ended up having the slashing issue, and so that's so we also downgraded straight edge to a test net as well. But yeah, so let's k- kind of get let's kind of get into the lock drop because personally, that was the piece of edgeware that I when I learned about that I was like, oh, this is super interesting. This is something new. So could you? Describe to us what is a lock drop. Yeah, a lock drop is basically locking your token, I guess, like ETH in this uh, specific case, and like uh, creating or minting like a, a new token, essentially. So for us, you could lock your Ethereum for three, six, or twelve months, and we allowed individuals to lock for during a, a three month period of time. So like, if they heard about it like early on, they wouldn't be like penalized, and for participating early or locking earlier on, they could get um, a bonus. And for locking for a longer amount of time, they could also get a bonus as well. And in addition to that, we, we added a like a, a feature called signaling. And so all you had to do was sign a message or, you know, and then like an event gets pop, pushed out. And so any, any address could participate um, in this process. So can you tell us... Uh- a bit about so why did you want to do a lock drop instead of a traditional take token sale or even an airdrop which is also a commonly used technique what what was the benefit of a lock drop yeah so it's i think it's basically incentivizing a certain segment of the community so tldr like 2017 ico craze token sale craze potentially attracts like those um, individuals who are looking for like more financial return or potentially attracts like uh, professional investors. And then there's also concerns around like regulation just via around that. Airdrops seems like they can kind of attract like a, certainly a wider distribution of folks um, who are interested in the network, but like probably don't incentivize the right crowd. Um, anyone might participate just because like they, they get a chance to like grab some free tokens. And so adding a little bit of skin in the game in terms of locking and, and giving up um, your opportunity cost felt like the right middle ground between a token sale um, and just an airdrop. But I guess the meta point, I think like for a network going forward, there's been proposals for Edgeware on Commonwealth um, to do like multi-chain lock drops and like get allocating tokens to different communities. I know Sunny's talked about doing a gas drop and I think going forward to incentivize or bring on um, different part- uh, community participants, like networks will use not just one, but like you know, many of these things, especially through the life cycle of the network to like 
and set up or yeah, bring on different people. So let's One talk about them. why this lock drop was particularly contentious in the community and the kind of backlash that, I mean, I don't know if backlash is the right word, but it, it did, I think, cause some people to be concerned, you know, what came out of that and specifically like straight edge. I think we need to explain like what straight edge is in this context. Yeah. So uh, the signaling feature that I alluded to, um, we allowed individuals, uh, developers to signal on behalf of contracts. And so that was the the specific I think point of contention and certainly Sonny can bring his perspective there. I, you know, I think I thought it was very interesting discussion that was generated from it. So we obviously, we had like a lot of individuals participate in lock drop and we felt like it, it went great. You know, I feel like if we're not like pushing experimentation forward, like crypto is like so early in the space that if we're not like, you know, having some features that like people actually disagree with, then like we're, we're doing a disservice because we, we certainly know, don't know like what the best practices are. And so I think, it basically comes down to that specific thing. And then uh, a sister network, Straight Edge, was kind of like birth where contract signalers would not be able to participate. Is that correct, Sonny? I actually can't remember at this point. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I could go a little bit and explain a little bit of what the specific concern that I had was. Was it, To me, it just didn't seem right that the premise of smart contracts is that the original deployer of a smart contract doesn't have any particular ownership over that contract. And so by allowing the, depo- let's say the deployer of the wrapped Ether contract, it's someone at the Maker Foundation team, they can suddenly signal on behalf of all of the wrapped Ether in, all of the Ether in the wrapped Ether contracts. And this seemed wrong to me. And so, you know, two of, there's two big contracts that got signaled from. One was the DAO contract actually by Nick Johnson. And then the other is the, uh, parity stuck funds from the, uh, well, the Web3 Foundation stuck funds in the parity multisig wallet. And that seemed odd to me. And then there's in the, um, design of the lock drop, there's also this feature called the generalized lock policy, which basically said if a contract that's signaled from acts like a lock, as in it can't send money out, it gets counted as a full lock rather than just a signal. And to me, at that point, it was very clear that this, functionality was added, not maybe not for only because, but in heavy part to allow the Web3 Foundation to be able to signal on behalf of their stuck funds. And to me, this just seemed like a some level of favoritism that I just didn't appreciate it being snuck in like this. If like it was decided that, hey, on the Edgeware initial distribution, we'll give 10% of the tokens to the Web3 Foundation for all their work in supporting parity substrate and Edgeware and whatnot. I think I would have been completely fine, but it's just the way that it was like kind of sneakily hidden in there kind of disturbed me. I don't know if I can give any type of official response, but I totally agree in terms of we could always do like a better job of communicating and handling these things. And I think, I guess that's like a whole lesson for any of these space coordinating around any type of like new launch expectations around that over communicate is like always the name of the game. And I think we've definitely through 2019, like, especially with respect to the Edgeware project, like learned the lesson there. So, Sunny, you and and some other people launched a sister network, Straight Edge. Can you just explain, sort of in this context, what was different about Straight Edge and how it responded to the, these concerns you had? Yeah, so primarily the main difference was that we basically, we took the lock drop contracts and at the end, we modified the Edgeware, their, their script that they had to pull the data and to create a Genesis file. And we modified it so we don't take into account people who signaled on behalf of contracts. So essentially, everyone else who properly locked or signaled from an actual user account, their their share of the network got increased. And people who... Because, for example, I actually am... I, I know of uh, people who, for example, run professional custodian services, and they did signal on behalf of some of their clients, which, you know, the, the, which was kind of the exact concern that I, I had. And so we, we kind of went ahead and zeroed out those balances and redistributed those tokens to the rest of the network. And we launched the ne- Straight Edge Network with, with the new balances, essentially. And the future of the Straight Edge Network is also you know, still in progress because similar to Edgeware, our, our September launch is also a little bit botched because of issues with the software. Well, sorry, I guess like the point on custodians signaling on behalf of clients. I mean, in, in general, like any token distribution process like is... I guess you can say there's winners and losers 
And so I guess it still comes down to like the specific spirit of the community. So like when, when Nick Johnson, like signaled on behalf of uh, the, like the Dow, like the withdrawal Dow funds, I decided like to give up ownership of that. And I think that's like, it always comes down to like who's participating. Cause certainly there's like, I guess like Ethereum whales out there that like could have participated in this whole process and just like dramatically skewed the uh, distribution or, or things like that. And so it, it always comes down to like, who is actually involved with these things versus like any overall process. I think any, any process is like always, uh, always to a certain extent gameable. And like, we, we have to always be aware of that, but, um, custodian signaling on behalf of their clients. I, I think that's an interesting case just because it's, you know, if we want those like end users to like actually participate in the network, like that was something that was like something that I think is like pretty okay, you know, because if we think they're going to be like good stakeholders within the network, then again, that, that was like one edge case of um, allowing like, contract with signalers to participate. Like, I think it's, it's kind of in the, the gray area and it's, you know, really up to anyone again, like to, they could uh, create like a new network on the, like from the, the edgeware distribution. And I would totally welcome that. I think it's, you know, all for more experimentation. I think it's all really cool. Yeah. I mean, I think that I, I remember around that time, like speaking to people and meeting people uh, and talking about edgeware and like around the time of the web three conference, people's impressions were that or at least some people that I talked to, like I think the, the concern that people had was that somehow like parody had influence on this and that, you know, this was in some form, I would say like a retribution, but a way for parody to like gain influence in this network, having you know, like all these locked funds and like the parody mm-hmm. smart contract. And I think like whether or not like that's true, like I don't think that's necessarily true, but you know, it, it kind of added you know, if there was this communication issue like that, uh, the connection to parity yeah. also created a, a little bit of maybe some like some theories about why this was in there. Right. Um, I don't know if you, you guys want to talk about that or you think that's <laughs> makes sense. Commonwealth Labs is an independent entity. Um, and like we, de- you know, definitely get like technical support from like Web3 Foundation parity. It, I think it's a great ecosystem. And like, I don't, I don't know if we get any special treatment. <laughs> so, but uh Parity can certainly be a contentious issue, um, especially within uh, the Ethereum community. So I'm, I think even when we announced, like it was already like things were popping up even even in 2018. So it's just interesting to to hear the I guess like conspiracy <laughs> conspiracy theories develop. You know, we could go on about this topic for for ages. Uh, the, the, on my, uh, I have like you know my little side podcast called Conspiratos. You can actually listen to a debate between myself and Ryan, and you know Dylan shows up for a little bit. So if you want to learn more about that debate, you can you can go check that out. But so could you tell like do you think that lock drops were they like a one time novelty thing where it was this like cool new like oh this is a quirky idea let's all and everyone got excited about it. Or do you think this is like a reasonable method of doing token distributions like going forward? To answer your question, yes, I think it's like a viable thing moving forward. But like there, it's always like as a general concept, the exact like distribution mechanism, three months, six months, 12 months might not be an actual thing, but like, you know, different permutations of it. So, but like the general concept of allocating decision making rights or tokens to a certain person who had holds some token, um, I think is like very interesting. So actually, I actually saw like on, on Hacker News, like Kong Bucks, like I guess they're doing a lock drop, which is really cool. Um, so I don't know if that was like some inspired by us or else. I like the the general concept of like allocating tokens to someone who has like done good work or like has hold some, so some token basically. So, you know, the lock drop could be generalized to like an NFT. So like if I held CryptoKitties and I, I wanted to like launch like a new Gods Unchained like V2, and I wanted to like target like the certain subset, they wouldn't have to like purchase a new token, like in, and like, or through like a token sale, but like I could lock my like crypto kitty mint, you know, this new token, this new kind of like game based NFT, you know, even using like other sources of like on chain data. So like, and then and this is something that Sunny's brought up um, as well as like, if I participated in a certain network, or for example, like if I've participated in compounds in any of those markets, um, I could be minted like a new token. Um, and that token could be like for a new stable coin type of thing, or it could be things there. So like this general notion of like, yeah, giving tokens to like other people, I think is, is going to be a powerful thing kind of moving forward, whether it's launching a new token or even like enhancing like the governance uh, system of, of like, you know, Edgeware specifically, like, you know, allocating a certain 
extra voting right to someone based on past participation might is like in a, an experiment that I, I would be happy to run. So what's the future of Edgeware? And and I think like one one important thing here maybe to, you know, how do you see Edgeware evolving in the Polkadot ecosystem? Like, will it become a parachain? And how is it complementary to sort of like the Polkadot network in general? Mm-hmm. And also what happens to Edge tokens? Are they meant to be staking tokens or... We think it'll be a pair chain, but that is, it is again up to like all the token holders to vote there. So, um, Commonwealth Labs only holds, you know, 4.5% of the network. So the vast majority has already been allocated, I think. And so I guess that there's a few questions. So on the, so we think it'll be a pair chain. Um, so we still have to, would have to get the community would still have to acquire dots to essentially stake as a uh, pair chain. In general, like a parachain, like um, still has to have its own token for like spam prevention, um, governance rights, things like that. But it's not used so much as a staking token, um, rather. Um, But I think the the most interesting thing is basically it's going to be interesting just in general, like how how these like communities work together in the future or any parachain kind of comes together just because it's basically like a a, a crypto merger, essentially. Um, And I, uh, Niraj and I, uh, wrote a blog post back in like 2017 um, on crypto mergers. And like, this is, you know, Edgeware becoming a pair chain, a network that potentially already has like an engaged community and has like overlap with uh, Polkadot as well. Um, how they'll kind of interact. How will the network fork if like validators don't like the kind of like economic scenario? Hopefully not, you know, hopefully everything can resolve with on-chain governance. But again, that's that's what kind of like forking is for. But yeah, it's, you know, the economic scenario, like things like playing out, that all has to be discussed. And then the last question that you asked, like, what's the hope for Edgeware and like, what do we kind of want to do? So yeah, in 2020, we, we basically just want to get as many DAOs participating and building on Edgeware as possible. So whether or not it's like a, in the crypto ecosystem, um, we've talked to Web2 or like real world <laughs> companies, so to speak, and co-ops to like create a DAO to like run, you know, coffee shop DAO. And that's like something that we're really excited to see, like these like experiments start to leak out, not just within the industry itself, but um, into the broader world. And hopefully into this whole decade, like we can continue to see the uh, the distribution and uh, usage. And where should people go if they want to learn more and find out when uh, Edgeware is launching? They should go to commonwealth.im, actually. So activity is being posted there. The team is posting on a daily, weekly basis. And uh, it links out to, you know, Edgeware homepage, as well as all the other kind of like chat based channels as well. Um, so if you search like Commonwealth Edgeware, I think, you know, it should be like the first result and then click in and come in uh, and explore the water. Great. Thanks for your time, Dylan. Thanks for coming on. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.